Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, welcome to South by. I'm so glad to see so many folks here. Uh, it's kind of impressive that like noon feels early in the morning. Um, but I want to get started real quick on this writer's room panel. And I'm going to let everyone else introduce themselves. Um, but first, I'm Monica Castillo. I'm a writer uh, for The Washington Post and for various other outlets. And then over to my right, I have Zach Anner. I am a, a writer on uh, Speechless on ABC, and I just moved away from Austin last year, and it's making me very sad. Oh. So. Well, welcome back. Thanks for having me back. <laughs> and this is Kendall McKinnon. Hi. I um, have been out in LA for about five and a half years, uh, screenwriting on various TV shows. Um, and when I come back home to Austin, I don't recognize it anymore. Mm -hmm. So um, I was on a NBC medical drama called The Night Shift, and then a USA crime drama called Eyewitness, and just finished working on a CBS all access drama called One Dollar that will be out in the fall. Congrats. And then Shin is uh, part of a show, very little, it's very small. I'm sure you guys have never heard of it. Uh, Walking Dead, did I get that right? Fear of the Walking Dead. Fear of the Walking Dead. <laughs> Hi guys, uh, sorry. Um, my name is Shin Shimasawa. I am uh, the co-EP of Fear of the Walking Dead that shoots here in Austin. I'm not from here like the other guys, um, but I do, uh, I'm happy to call it the, our new home. It's really terrific. Um, I've been working in one hour television for many years now and, uh, and I'm excited to be here. So we have a mix of experiences, and I want you to already start thinking about questions you may want to ask. But first, I want to find out how everyone here got their start. I got my start, I would say, on public access in Austin, working for the student television station. Um, and we made a sketch comedy show here. Um, and then I just sort of continued making DIY stuff and had some things that go go viral and did uh, continued working on the craft here and then you know went out to do co some consulting last year on Speechless um, and, and they're like hey have you done this before and I was thinking about it and I was like oh yeah I've been doing this for the past 12 years I just haven't been thinking about it that way so uh, basically. Austin made me, is what I want to say. I'm just pandering to this audience. <laughs> um, well, I knew I wanted to be a TV writer as soon as I got out to LA and moved out there hoping to get a job as a writer's assistant, which is kind of the stepping stone into the writer's room. And I was naively thinking that would be easy to do. Um, it wasn't that easy. Uh, after a year, I still hadn't gotten that job. and. Um, I had a brief crisis of faith and considered becoming a magician's assistant, and... <laughs> that is the most L.A. answer. <laughs> I know. Um, and right before I went to interview with this really potentially creepy magician who wanted to meet me at a penthouse suite in the Beverly Hills Hotel, I ended up getting a job uh, through a friend working as a producer's assistant on a TV show, and that ended up leading to becoming a writer's assistant and eventually staff writer. Nice. Um, I uh, worked at a, a small studio for a little while that that just vaporized. It closed its doors, and I had no job, and I was unemployed. So, ended up uh, writing a few scripts. And fortunately, I worked for an agency when I first moved to LA, and I sent it to my old boss, who was able to get it into the right hands, and uh, and kind of started from there. How important is an agency when you're first starting out? Because not everyone has the same path as a writer, mm -hmm. uh, and I. I'm a little curious about that. Um, well, there's, I would say an agent, an agent will certainly help you uh, when you're starting out, and it's the one thing that most people want uh, right off the bat. Um, I, I would say that like if you, if you have a special script and it's written and it's either really great or robust or funny or really heartfelt, um, just make sure it's amazing before you submit it to that agent because you generally have one shot with those guys. Um, but it's not the be all end all. I mean, you really need to be out there and um, kind of know what's going on and educate yourself as to what shows are being picked up so you could help the agent um, 
in case they are not fully committed to you all the time. So. Fair enough. Also, run your spell check again before you send. <laughs> it's also good advice. Um, I wanted to find out, so you get this job, and then you go into the writer's room. What is that like? It's a bunch of people throwing around ideas, uh, throwing things to see if they stick on the wall. How do you then create a script out of that? Uh, well, for us, like with Speechless, for those of you who don't know, it's sort of a unique a sitcom because it deals with uh, a family where one of the kids is nonverbal and has cerebral palsy. So for us, crafting stories is new territory that has never been dealt with in most cases. And there's a whole community of people that are just dying for representation. Um, and so we usually, you know, start with an area or just like something that gets us excited. And like, how would our characters deal with a dating scenario? Or like, what, what is the, the route to, to talking about this thing that's unique to our characters? And like, then just what makes us laugh? You know, so we have bullseyes in the Speechless Writers Room, which is a rock star family, disability specific, and you know, like funny, and heartfelt, and what can we do that's gonna make, hit all those bullseyes, and, and just make a story that feels very unique and that people have never seen before. Um, and then there's a lot of playing games. There's a lot of games, <laughs> a lot of fun times. What, what kind of games? Um, tippy Catchy, which is basically uh, keep the balloon up with a mini football, and there are many, rules to tippy catchy, which I won't get into, but one of the biggest lessons that I took from this writer's room that I had sort of forgotten about, just like working on uh, other stuff, is that it really helps, especially when you're writing a comedy, to be in a good mood and having a good time. Like, the uh, Scott Silveri, who created speechless uh, and draws a lot from his own life is his he has the most generous spirit and and really does a great job of putting everyone in a headspace to come up with funny stuff so i i come from a background of like working with one other person or working with a group of guys that i've known for since college and just like hammering through and like we've got to find this joke and it doesn't matter if we don't sleep and we're not happy of like with the rest of our lives and I was like oh being funny uh, is sort of contingent on on at least base level being happy and enjoying your time. Uh, well, I've worked on mostly darker stuff, and um, is it the same rule where you just have to be depressed all the time? I was going to say, honestly, I really try to come into work every day with the mind of a serial killer, which um, is easy if you've you know done it before. Which uh, no, it, it actually on the dramas I found that it also really helps to be in a light mood because you are getting into really dark territory sometimes. Um, but just to sort of uh, return to your initial question. I had wanted to be in a writer's room since I was in high school and had sort of built it up in my mind. And my first job was as an assistant. So I was going in very nervous and not really like aware of how a room worked or what I was supposed to do. And my job was to literally write down every single thing every writer said the whole day, which is exhausting. Um, and you actually, I mean, the most interesting part is trying to stop typing when they start talking about things that are not related to the show, which happens a lot. Um, I would be talking about like medical mysteries and then all of a sudden like some basketball game the night before and it's like, no. Um, but the takeaway when I first started in the room was that it was everything I expected it to be and more. It was just magical and it is really the most fun job I could possibly imagine. Um, it's, you know, it's creative, you're in a space, it's a bubble, you're with other people and you have this like one goal and you really kind of turn on, I mean, turn off the outside world and get wrapped up in those characters and and then you get paid for it, which is awesome. <laughs> uh, I would echo 
what the other two guys said um, about having fun in a room. I think when you're in a headspace where you are having fun and it's loose and you feel safe, you could be extremely creative. You can get excited about the stories that you pitch. Um, yeah, that's about it. And, and for you, as an EP, it's a little bit of a different dynamic. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm guessing that you get to call the final shots. Sometimes, uh, if, yeah. If sometimes. Uh, when, when does it happen that you don't get to? Well, I mean, what's actually just going back to constructing your writer's rooms, uh, our bosses, and I've been very fortunate in the last few shows, they, they tend to put rooms together um, with people of different backgrounds um, that are completely on opposite ends of the spectrum. And that really helps out too, because once you're all in a safe creative space and you're having fun and you hear all these differing point of views, it's, it's pretty terrific. Uh, it's, you'll, you'll get ideas that you hadn't uh, thought about before. And in looking for your own feedback on some of your scripts, I would suggest you do that too. Don't just go to screenwriters, go to anybody, um, anybody that might be the audience for your show. Talk to normals. Talk to normals. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask, uh, since um, we had to, the previous two writers had to put themselves in a funny mindset and maybe a dark mindset, do you have to put yourself in the mindset of survivors or zombies? Sometimes. I, I, I think only when you write. Um, it would be a little daunting if you're in the writer's <laughs> room and, <laughs> and you're feeling uh, like some of the characters on the show do. Yeah. Um, so work itself is very creative, and you come in with all these different ideas. How do you sustain uh, being that creative all the time? Do you have outside projects? Do you do things on the side? I know, Zach, you do. Uh, oh, you did at least uh, some YouTube stuff for a while there. Yeah, I mean, uh, I feel like it's important to always have your own things going. Like, typically, um, like, if you don't, because speechless at a certain point, the days would get to be like 16 hours. And it would, like during, um, actually during uh, production on speechless, um, like on the weekends, I would go and shoot another web show with my writing and producing partner, Jillian Grassy, who's like, and like just to have that other speed of like working with somebody else uh, and like, doing something completely different. I was doing a show on climate change and was able to like come back into the writer's room and just focus on that. I don't have a social life, like zero friends, but I am like, I do feel very productive. Like the more, the more I have to do, the more productive I am. And the, the, like, and it's nice with Speechless, like to, to go home and like think of, just a completely different realm so that when you go back into that writer's room, it sort of jogs other things because it's very easy to get stuck um, on something or just obsess about it to the point where it's not fun anymore. And the, the thing to remind yourself always that I remind myself every day is like, I'm the luckiest guy in the world to be in this position to be working on this show. And just anything that reminds you of that, do that. Yeah, I think it's really important to sort of um, turn it off when you're not in the room sometimes. Um, for me, that was just binge watching Seinfeld. Uh, <laughs> Zach is making me look bad. Not at all. Um, I, I toggle between movies and, and TV. Um, I wouldn't say that's actually the most creative outlet because it's working as a, a screenwriter to a screenwriter. However, I do, I love music. Um, for the first few years in a room, I was like the music person. That was like the one thing that I can, I can really binge on and, and understand and kind of give it that give that kind of perspective um, to the room. And now you're a movie and TV person. Yes. I'm kind of curious for everyone. It was there a moment when you were watching television when you were younger that you realized, wow, that was a really well written episode. I. I think the the show that, and I was probably about maybe like 16 when this came out, but the first show where I I noticed the writing was The Office with Ricky Gervais. Mm. And uh, I mean, I would obviously love things like Seinfeld and all these other shows, but that was the 
the first show I watched where it's like I can feel these characters and I can like understand the way that this is crafted and it also feels like something I could do, something attainable. So yeah, I mean, that was sort of a moment in high school where it's like, okay, maybe I could make shows. <laughs> yeah, I would say um, I never noticed a particular show that had or episode um, for its really good writing because I think really good writing is invisible and the what I would notice is really bad writing and then I would maybe realize after I watched a show or you know a season of a show wow that was probably really well written because I didn't notice how badly it was written so I'd say maybe Friday Night Lights was the first thing that I binged in high school and really felt that. Nice. Um, for me I'm a little older than these guys uh, it was an episode of ER, I don't know if you guys remember that show, it was, you know, everything took place in an ER. It was like, it was groundbreaking in many ways. They did steady cam and really cool moves around the ER for the first time, and it was John Wells and his wonderful writing. Um, but there was an episode where George Clooney was going to a gala one night, and he was helping a patient, and the patient dropped a joint, and he picks it up, and he's like, I'm gonna go smoke this joint and go to this gala. And he gets out of the ER, he gets in his car, it's pouring rain, he's about to light up a joint, and uh, a kid starts banging on the window, and he says his brother is stuck in a drain um, down the street, so he takes his tux off and runs down, and the whole episode takes place where he's trying to help this kid um, from drowning, and at the very end, the kid uh, gets out, but his legs are broken, and it's really bad, and there's a chopper on the way, and uh, the kid sinks underneath the water, and George Clooney comes up, just when the chopper hits and there's a spotlight that hits him. And I'll never forget this shot. And I was like, wow, this is, it, was, it just changed the game for me because I had been so used to watching a show that was on pattern, um, meaning takes place in the ER all the time, to a show that was off pattern. And I really cared for this character. I really understood where he was coming from and everything he's dealt with over the season. That was the first time I, I was like, this is a really cool, it must be really cool to think of that stuff. Has there been any moment where you wanted to try something like that? There's something you saw before in a television show and you wanted to do your own spin on that? Oh, for sure, yeah. I mean, it, I couldn't cite a specific example, but everybody, a lot of people have these kind of stories where they remember a particular episode and it's really about the way they felt and not about the plot. So a lot of times they'll pitch it out in the room and we will try to emulate that because once in a while you forget simple things like we have to make this show heartbreaking or heartfelt even though it's a horror show or you know it, it's it it really just kind of spans genres and to, it's very genre unspecific in that regard and for you you too yeah i i think like it it is just like when when you can do something that because you get it, it is easy to to get into like the patterns, and it's very helpful to have like the, those things that you know you'll always come back to. But occasionally you'll you'll have an idea that just is like so out there, and it's it's just like those are the moments where it's like oh this this is why we've been we've been fighting through this to get to this point where it's like okay. N now it's cool. Now we can do something that just completely is going to make our audience go, uh, the, we didn't expect that. You know, and like, I feel like um, for us, it's, it's also there's the weight of, of, you know, like having our audience see people with disabilities in a way that they never expected. So it translates into real life of, of, you know, our audience can see something on our show that will change their perspective on a whole group of people, which is cool. And, and it's, it's really nice when you can do that and make people laugh doing it. Yeah, I think um, it's really tricky because there's so much TV out there and in a way everything has kind of been done, especially when you're working on a crime show or a medical show like I have, which are, you know, these sort of staple genre shows, um, which is why it's hard. Um, 
I think the character relationships and, and really finding that feeling that separates a storyline that may have been done before um, by grounding it in something that the audience really cares about that's specific to your show is um, kind of always the challenge. Um, but it's hard because there's so much out there right now. Every time you think you come into the room with an idea, someone else in the room is like, oh no, that was on like the fall. Like, no, you, that was on this. And you're like, shit. <laughs> um, so it's tricky, yeah. Yeah, also a challenge is how do you continue to grow as a writer? Um, we always want to continue to push our craft. We always want to continue to try new things. Um, how do you sustain your sort of career development while also working in a writer's room? That, to me, that sort of, uh, because I'm a first year writer on a television show, that's like every day for me, is, is learning on the job, learning how much I already knew instinctively and how much I don't know and being surrounded by people that continually like surprise me with how brilliant they are and like realizing where that comes from like the and there are moments in the writers room where i just will laugh hysterically at some something someone else says or or just like come up with an idea that is still so inspiring to me. Like we did a Halloween episode where JJ, our main character who uses a wheelchair and is on like nonverbal, gets like possessed by the devil. And then the devil realizes through possessing him how the world is not accessible and that makes him upset. <laughs> and it's like, that's just really, really funny. And it's a story that our, only our show could do. Um, and um, so I'm just like, every day I go in and there's these moments where I'm like, wow, these people are, are these people who are my peers are also what I want to aspire to. Yeah, I think that's the best thing to me about being in this industry is that inherently it is sort of set up so that you're always doing something different and always learning. Um, you know, you're going from show to show, unless you're on, you know, a really good show that <laughs> stays on the air for a long time. Um, but yeah, I've, I, I get to go from one writer's room to another and meet new people and have new challenges and new characters, which is really exciting. It's like, I'm always learning. I, um, I love it. Um, <clears throat> some of the best lessons I've had is um, right now, for the first time in history, you can actually just get seasons of a show and watch them, and that kind of expanded the library in the TV universe quite a bit, because you can actually go back and watch old, uh, like like a second season of a show that you know people love, and then you can kind of interrogate why they loved it, um, whether it was something that was going on in the world at the time, or if it was just one of those shows that if you put it out right now in its second season, that specific season, it would still do great. And you can clearly see why. There's, you know, there's plot lines that'll pull you in, that'll keep you interested, um, that make you care for the characters. And it's stories that you had never seen before. And like Zach said, there's sometimes what the best episodes of television are episodes that you can only do on that show. And you'll hear that a lot in writer's rooms. Like, you know, when you come in with, um, just a t typical murder who done it on a procedural, they want to know why their team is the only team that can crack that case. And if, if, it's, if there is no really great answer, then they're not going to do that story. Essentially, you, you really have to kind of learn what you can about um, breaking story and then be able to apply it to that particular show um, to have their characters deal with it in a very unique way. Were there any shows in particular that you revisited in order to sort of deconstruct in that way? Um, the West Wing, I revisited it only because I had never seen it and I heard it was amazing and I was really blown away. Um, when I was on, uh, I did, I was on the spinoff for Criminal Minds before that, I was just trying to pull in as, me, as much procedural experience as I can. Mm -hmm. And I watched the first two seasons of Hill Street Blues, which were pretty remarkable, so. Nice. Yeah. Did you, uh, Zach and uh, Kendall, uh, revisit any old shows? I mean, that, that's my life when I'm not working, is revisiting <laughs> old shows. Is just because I love them. I, I guess, like, it's not 
specifically wanting to go back and watch through Seinfeld chronologically for the sake of being in a writer's room. It's just because I, when that show came out, I was like 10. <laughs> and wa watching it back now, like in order, you realize just how much of the stuff, like how much of it carries through and just like how um, you can really sense a change when Larry David leaves and the characters change and, and like you realize, okay, this is how the perspective of the show changed and the episodes of the show that you could never do now because they're, you know, there's a whole episode where they're waiting by a payphone for someone to call. And like, or like they have mix-ups about timing and when they're gonna show up and meet people and it's like this would, a lot of these storylines are gone because of cell phones. <laughs> and it's just neat to see that stuff and like what what's universal and what, what's interesting to me is a lot of the the comedies from back in the 90s the really funny ones would work without laugh tracks you would still laugh um so it's it's just been yeah i watch things obsessively but it's great and it's great with something like the west wing where you everyone has seen it and you haven't you get to go on that whole journey like, and it's just awesome. And other people had to wait months and months between seasons, and you're like, <laughs> well, you're a sucker, because I can just watch this whole thing. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, in between seasons, um, or when I'm out of a room, um, I tend to definitely binge stuff. I, I did go back and watch all of ER again, because I was a kid when that came out. And uh, Six Feet Under, The Sopranos, which I told people I'd seen and hadn't, so I had to go back. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that's always, um, it's always important to, to go back and remind yourself why things were working um, and why things carry through. And I, I also try to watch like a little bit of all the shows that are sort of current right now that people are watching, but I tend to only watch a couple episodes of each, and then once I feel like I'm getting pulled in, I shut off and <laughs> can't do it. Wow, that's self-control. <laughs> I also wanted to find out, since we are talking about the modern-day writer's room, about the role of social media. It's been really interesting to see writer's room sort of open up on Twitter in a way that we really haven't seen before. Have, you, have any of you been involved with those sort of like social media campaigns? Uh, yeah, I mean, it is, that is what drives, I, I feel like that is what drives people to watch shows is just how shareable certain things are, um, because the, it, like, for anyone to be watching TV on a TV these days, it's like, it's a, it's a miracle, um, mm -hmm. but, like, it really does help, especially with a show like ours, where the the viewership is is varied, but then there's this really dedicated community of people that just when you get it right, it's just like you you are speaking to them in a way that nobody ever has, and so they're really prone to to share things and um, you know and and so many people um, will say why don't you do a story on this and it's nice when we're already doing it. Like, and we feel like we're just like, got our finger on the pulse of, of what we're trying to do. So like, yeah, it's, it's great for the feedback. Um, like, I, I honestly love reading the comments, even when we get a few negative ones, it's still fun. And like, oh, well, yeah, that, that makes sense, hadn't considered it. But there is so much consideration that goes into like, what is, what's the audience gonna think? Yeah, I think, um, I wasn't really working in TV that much before social media. It is interesting how fans engage. I've, it kind of depends. I've worked on shows that are, we're still writing as we're shooting, which is really different from others. The last two I worked on, we pretty much wrote the whole season before it aired. So it's definitely one thing. I mean, when when you're still writing, sometimes, yeah, you, you'll do those Twitter campaigns as the show is airing, and you're like, oh, shit, people really don't like this, like, <laughs> coupling of this, you know, these two characters. And sometimes that actually does come back into the room and make a difference. Um, it's... Uh, 
you know, and then when you've already written the whole series, it's like, well, oops, <laughs> sorry, uh, too late. But uh, yeah, I find that it's, I am really bad at, at Twitter and that stuff, it stresses me out, but getting the, uh, the actors engaged in those sort of um, like Twitter campaigns where they're interacting with fans as they're watching the show, which for me is like, guys, wait, focus, don't do both at the same time. But it really, it, it really sparks a lot of, you know, interest and excitement, and they really like to engage with um, the, the actors. Yeah. Um, sadly, on our show, we have no uh, social media presence. We just no. Our, our, uh, you never get feedback from friends. Oh France. no, no, we get tons of feedback. Trust <laughs> me. No, it's it's our uh, our, our parent company and our showrunner um, on The Walking Dead, mm -hmm. who uh, oversees both. Um, kind of. Uh, does not um, participate in the social media thing, and it's up to the network uh, AMC that recruits the actors to do that kind of stuff. So oh, it's okay. well after yeah. we are done working. Would you like to be more involved in social media? No. no. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna open uh, the room up for questions. So if people wanna start lining up, that would be great. Uh, don't hop all up at once. But I have one, one last question before I open it up. Um, I'm curious as to, we're talking so much more about like diversifying writers' rooms and um, what, what can be done about that. There's been, you know, all these different initiatives about, you know, getting more diverse voices in there, but is there something that you could be doing or are you are doing in terms of like mentoring or recommending people for jobs? Yeah, I mean, I think it it's, our show is pretty unique in that every actor that has, um, a, a, like every character that has a disability on the show, we actually, the, the, the actors actually have that disability. And it's, a, and also our show brings in a lot of, of consultants uh, who can bring that level of authenticity to the show. And I, I think like, that's always been the mindset uh, of our show because if it doesn't ring true, then why even make it? Mm -hmm. um, but I think the the thing that I'd like to see more writers' rooms do is, you know, like I used to be of the camp have have it just be based on on the talent, which I think when it comes down to it, it should be. But you have to make sure that that door is open and that people you would normally overlook or look through are still getting that opportunity because the industry is very, um, you, if you know who you know, you're not necessarily gonna open that door to other people, right? Um, so I think it really would take, it, you gotta be proactive about it. You have to find people uh, of, of you know, different uh, races, you have to find people of, of different physical abilities and you have to seek them out and give them the opportunities and the tools so that they can thrive. And like, I, I hope that um, Speechless and other shows w can show that it can be done and it, it, it's worthwhile to do because it's, there are so many great writers out there that just, may not have as many open doors. And it's really our responsibility to, to do that. Um, I totally agree with all of that. And I think it's wildly important to have diversity in the room. Um, it, for example, like uh, on the last show I was on, I was the only woman in the room, which was really interesting. And they had already kind of outlined the season when I came in. And there were 10 main characters eight were men and two were women. And within the first week, it was five and five because I kept saying, you know, they would describe a character and I'd say, so, so what if, uh, you know, she was a woman? And they would kind of sit there and say, kind of go through the checklist in their mind like, oh, yeah, I guess that could be a woman. I just never really thought about it like that. And it's really just, they, they didn't think about it. And I came in and was like, well, um, so it's huge to have representation. Um, and I, I definitely uh, try to do as much mentoring as I can. And like Zach said, just really going out there and looking around and finding people who feel like, you know, they don't have an entry point into the, the um, 
into the industry and kind of looking for entry level jobs. I always have my eye out for assistant positions on all my shows and recommending people that wouldn't normally get recommended, that don't have connections. So, yeah. Um, yes, we are, I am, and we are always aware of uh, trying to keep the room diverse. Like I said, if, if you have a room that has a bunch of different people from a bunch of different worlds, it it only enhances the story, so we, we really fight to try to find that. Nice, and we're gonna open up first with this side. Hello, thanks for your time, uh, guys, it's been great. Um, I've always wanted to know a little bit at, kinda, at a high level um, how things, how, I guess kinda how workflow goes, which sounds so mechanical, but you know, when you start, how does it start from like you have a season and then gets to the episodes and gets to the final writing, like do you all, do you have a discussion at the season level, and then do, you, do certain writers get assigned certain episodes, and it goes back in the room? Or I, I imagine there's more than one way, and that would be interesting too. But I'm just kind of wondering how that kind of uh, how that just kind of generally works. Yeah, uh, you want me to start? Um, yeah. <laughs> in my experience, uh, <clears throat> it kind of is what you think it is. You get together. Uh, for the first couple weeks, you have a little, a couple uncomfortable lunches with all the new writers, and then you get to know each other, and then while you're doing that, you're talking about seasonal arcs, you're talking about what the showrunner had um, planned on um, the arcs landing in, and uh, kind of where they're starting, and then you can kind of, after you start talking about those big arcs, it gets um, simpler to kind of parse out the smaller um, stories, but really on a, on a meta level, that's uh, generally how it's been in my experience. Thanks. Yeah, um, it's, it is kind of what you'd think, I guess. Um, there's a lot of collaboration in the beginning, and we put up cards on a board just like completely. I mean, the writer's room is pretty, hasn't changed much, I feel like, in many years. It's still literally just note cards pinned up to a board episode by episode, and you do you know, character arcs all the way through, and if it's a procedural, you have, you know, different color cards for different characters or for different storylines. And, um, and then once you sort of get down into the sort of micro level, you also have network execs who have to go through everything and approve it, and then you have to go back and change things when they don't like it. Um, but then, yeah, it gets assigned to different writers. You do a, your own version of it, come back into the room, you know, give it to the showrunner, they do their pass, sometimes it's, you know, they don't have to do much, sometimes they completely change it or you have to do lots of different rewrites and then again it goes through different processes of going to studios and networks and getting notes and having to do rewrites. So it's laborious, but yeah, pretty much what you think. I, yeah, I think the, the biggest surprise for me was just how um, collaborative every step of the process is. Like, uh, we'll have writers that'll go off and do drafts, but that's after we've beaten the whole story out, done a story area, which is like a three-page uh, version of just like every story gets two paragraphs, and then like then you do an outline, which is a scene-by-scene, scene, um, you know, like construction of what what the script will be. Then the writer will take their pass at a writer's draft, and then the whole room, in our case, will you know rewrite and punch up, and then you do the table read, and then you get the notes, and then you do another pass, and then that's the production draft, but then still, up until the days where they're shot, you know, if there's a better joke or a better way to say something, you're still working on it. Uh, th but that's just how speechless works. But it is, you know, like there's uh, speechless scripts. Every every script is is representative of of what everyone brings to the table that week. And sometimes it's more, and sometimes it's less. But we're all in there, which is I I, I find it pretty cool because I love collaborating with people for sure. Nice, and to the other mic. Hi, uh, so do you guys feel any impetus or obligation, whether it's from yourself personally or from your representatives, to continually generate your own original work 
particularly, you know, if, if your show doesn't get picked up and you need another job, it's good to have that pilot. And if you want to go another route, it's good to have a feature. So, uh, so I guess, do you feel any obligation? How much of your own original work do you or are you able to even write with this current job? And also just how does your current job influence your original voice and influence your original work when you are able to actually do it? Um, I guess uh, when I've worked on network shows, a lot of it does become limiting just because going through the collaborative process, there is a lot of steps that go through um, before it makes it onto air. So for me, it was, it was really great. I, I'm, I'm a horror person normally, so I like to go way darker and way bloodier sometimes. So a lot of times it's great to just be able to refocus energy into writing something completely different um, than what I've been doing. So I guess that's kind of how it influences. I mean, short answer, yes. Um, especially, I mean, at my level where I, I'm a staff writer, so I'm still you know, on my way up. And uh, yeah, my agents and managers are always like, what do you have next? What do you have next? Um, and if it's not scripts, it's pitch ideas and um, you know, uh, concepts for meetings, but it's yeah, it's really important to keep you know sharpening your own stuff, and I tend to write a lot more of my own stuff when I'm working on a show that I don't like as much, because <laughs> um, it kind of gives me this drive to go home and be like, I can do better than this. So yeah, yeah, I'd I'd agree with all of that. Like, and it it's um, so what what. Um, what we're working on now is is adapting um, my book into a show and like just like doing the pilot and crafting the outline uh, for that and it's just uh, for me like the experience of working on Speechless has just been like a a, a master class in that and there, then there's also like stories that I know I can't tell on Speechless that are just like, oh, that gets you more excited because you like, this will never be on ABC at 8.30 on a Wednesday. It's, so, you know, let's, let's go um, full out with this. It, it's almost helped to refine the voice more because it's like, this is what I want to say that I still can. And it really helps you zero in on that. Thanks. Thanks. To the other mic. Hi. Uh, so I was going to say that my favorite TV shows are the ones who are able to balance different sort of genres into one TV show because life isn't just a comedy or just a drama or just a romance. So I wanted to know what your advice was to sh writers who are struggling with trying to balance all of that out in one TV show when it feels like it's so constrained into one genre. Um, I, I would say some of the most successful shows, whether it's uh, mixed genre or a very specific genre is when they're able to create like, like a really vivid world. So if you're able to do that, um, that vivid world will help dictate um, things moving forward. Uh, there, there was a, a script that Brian Fuller wrote called Wonderfalls. If you guys haven't read it, it's really awesome. But I remember reading that script and I, I was like, I have no idea what, what this show is going to be. But this guy had it all in his head and he was able to, it, it's basically about a girl who works at a souvenir shop in Niagara Falls and those little plastic animals that they sell, they start talking to her. And she starts doing things based on what they are suggesting and they, and as the, the pilot goes through, you realize that she's improving her life and other people's lives by doing so, which is insane, but it's a very, very specific world and he had it very well fleshed out. So I would say really, um, Think about the world, and I think uh, it'll it'll get a lot easier. And also, if the story comes from really well defined characters, um, I think that makes it a whole lot easier because you're not like I just m want to make something that's really funny or really dramatic. You want to make something that's honest to the characters and the world you've built. So I I think. That stuff will come naturally if you just know who your characters are and know the, like, the stories that you want to tell. 
Yeah, I would agree with all that. I think genre bending and blending right now is really big. And um, people are, because there's so many shows and so many platforms, people are always trying to find new ways to to, to do that. Um, but uh, as Shen was saying, specificity is key. So as long as, I mean, if you're going to have a non-specific genre, make sure there's something specific about your story and why you're telling it that kind of rises to the surface. Thank you so much. The other mic. Hey, um, so my question's a little bit specific. Um, it's mostly directed for Zach, uh, but I would love to hear y'all's thoughts too, because it sort of relates to the media. And uh, Zach, I'm a huge fan of your videos. They're absolutely hilarious. Uh, well, thanks. I was, yeah, uh, I was introducing them to my partner. Um, we work on a sexual wellness company, and we design products for those with mobility issues. And I know this is a little bit of a taboo subject, but you know, it's an inclusive product. And one of the things that I was really taken in what you spoke to was about changing people's perspectives on disabilities. We even went to a panel earlier at South by uh, for women who were disabled talking about, you know, the media's perception of disabilities and sexuality. And I was just wondering if you and the rest of the panelists had any thoughts on how we can change people's perspectives and make people realize that everyone is a sexual being, even if they have a disability, because they're not often portrayed in that way. In fact, hardly ever. Um, yeah, I think, well, uh, we're working on it. Uh, my, we are too. <laughs> uh, uh, like, and uh, with, with a, a family sitcom on ABC, that's kind of hard to go as far as I would want to, which yeah. is, um, but I do think it's, it's um, just, Making characters with disabilities with depth and first making the point that people with disabilities want the same things that everybody else wants, which is somehow still not really out there. Um, and then just portraying it honestly. Like with Speechless, uh, we've been delving into online dating and that type of thing, and just like the the struggle of you know, do you how much do you show the chair? How much do you talk about the disability? And like that comes from my own life, um, and that struggle. And I think the first battle is just ma making three dimensional characters who want those things, and then um, hopefully when you know by the end of the of the hiatus, Jillian and I will have something that is like, that will show some of those awkward, like more, I, uh, those awkward sexual situations that you find yourself in uh, when you have a disability and just kind of be raw and honest about it. And like, I think the, the thing for a broad audience is, is being, uh, you know, showing that the emotional journey is universal, even if you know there are different paths to that. Um, so, just um, I would love to to have more sexualization of people with disabilities, uh, me specifically. So, um, <laughs> you know, if you have any ideas, that would be great. I I'd love to talk to you more. Thanks. I'm just curious if any of y'all have other thoughts, too, just about writers and that perspective. Um, uh, to, to that point specifically, I don't. However, I think the, the product sounds awesome. Best of luck. I love new tech, and that sounds really cool. Uh, good Fun luck with tech. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I mean, I could sort of go into some other. Uh, but, I mean, Zach's answer is so good. I know we have a lot of other questions. So yeah, I'll absolutely. Thank you guys so yeah. much. Thank you. Hi, um, you've described the writing room as a very collaborative place where kind of chemistry happens, you're playing off of each other. I, I guess I, when you get a group of people in a room, there's always a little bit of this uh, awkwardness or power. There's always something like, oh, how do you vote somebody off the island? You know, is there, are there ground rules and is there leadership and a hierarchy of who facilitates the process to keep it on track. So I'd love to hear more about the people dynamics there. Yeah, I mean, there generally is. There, as anyone up here will tell you, um, people get stuck. It's very frustrating. Um, a lot of times, uh, 
for me personally, I would say like one of the killers in procedural television or one hour television sometimes is cynicism because you've seen, everybody's heard all the stories before. Um, you're not coming up with in, something entirely original. However, um, if you're able to lift the cynicism out of the room and come into it as a, as a new viewer that's watching this episode for the first time, doesn't know much about the show, um, it, it can be very fun. And it's, it's, you can work past some of those issues or um, people with issues that are in the room very quickly if you're able to just make everyone understand that we're trying to make something that is going to shock or, or inspire people. Uh, yeah, it depends on the show, uh, I think, um, and whether or not it's a procedural, how big the room is. But what, yeah, I mean, there's there's some rules that I think are changing, but typically, like when I came in, th there is um, a hierarchy of levels of writer. So when I was an assistant, I would sometimes pitch ideas, but I would definitely not be allowed, and it's like unspoken rules kind of, but I wouldn't be allowed to pitch until all the other writers had pitched. And then even when I'm a staff writer, I kind of you'd, you'd wait until the story editor had pitched before you. And I mean, but then I was in a room where there was only four of us and nobody cared, and you would just, you know, always be collaborating. But usually there's like a co-EP or somebody who will get people back on track if we start to, you know, get into bad spaces or start to disagree. And um, and then once the, if the showrunner is somebody who's sometimes always in the room, sometimes not, but typically the showrunner comes in, then it's like everybody's on their best behavior and you're pitching them the best ideas and um, and uh, trying to sort of one-up each other. But usually, yeah, it, t it totally depends on the people in the room. Every room I've been in, it's been very different in that regard. Yeah, and I think it's important to be supportive of other people in the room and, and you know, really try and listen and elevate other people's ideas when they have them because it is very, the inclination is to just be the, the to just to like say whatever you want to say and hope that it gets through and like, but I, I think the, the most important thing is a good idea is a good idea no matter where it comes from. And when we get stuck as a room and we're like really just trying to work through a story, what we try to do is take a step back from it and like, okay, what do we love? What got us excited? Let's put that on the board and see what what comes up from there. Because even like, and our showrunner is so great that even like a bad idea that's pitched, he's very patient um, because there's something that he can take the the seed of something even in a pitch that won't fly and say well, I liked this here, what if we moved from this? And so just always be looking for that seed of something you like because that can spark um, a whole storyline. And, and uh, just like, sometimes it's great to be able to take five and just go get a snack and then come back and be, because I found, and maybe this is like different for everyone, that like punishing yourself through something rarely leads to the most creative solution to a problem. Um, uh, and so just remember that like you love this. Next question. Okay, so the last writer's room I was in was actually in a group of uh, actors and writers with intellectual disabilities. So I'm working with this group called Jesters, but I also teach high school international baccalaureate high school film. So I have a writer try to, I'm trying to recreate the writer's room there. And what I guess, uh, she, you, she has asked part of my question about how you do that collaboratively, but also like <clears throat> who says, um, uh, who decides like, oh no, you, we're, we can't do that. Oh, oh no no no! You know what I'm I'm saying? Like, like when you start to like put ideas out there, you know, I can find as a mom. I'm also a mom of an adult son with an inte intellectual disability, and so I can see something and not be offended by it because I see the string of it running through my community. But other people are like, oh, I don't know if I can laugh at that. I'm not. I don't know. And I also find that also with 
the working in the private schools, some of the racial and uh, income disparity, like people are uncomfortable with if they can say something or if they're allowed to. So how does that, I guess I'm just asking for some guidance, like how could I recreate that, uh, the, what you guys are doing there without hurting, these, any, hurting anyone? <laughs> are, you, are you running the writer's room? No, we were, it was collaborative. There's a, okay. I, I'm just an assistant with the, the director. In gestures, yeah. I was just an assistant. I'm there, my son is in the program. Gotcha. And, um, uh, but I might end up, like, I'm looking to eventually probably do what the director's doing at this point. Maybe not next year, but the year after that. I mean, I would suggest just getting as many different viewpoints in the room as you can. Um, some people might be sensitive, some people might be insensitive, and I think that's much better, just that you have, um, those, you kind of want that debate in the room, whether whether or not um, it's fun at the in the moment, because in the moment you're going to be like, oh man, this is stopping us, this is stopping us. But really, you kind of just need that um, once in a while, just to just to be able to dot all your eyes and cross all your t's and make sure that you're either handling a subject matter with uh, the best possible uh, gloves, or if it's whether you're handling a story with the best possible care. So, I would say just if you can, just get a lot of different point, points of view in the room, and uh, that'll help. Yeah. And I would say don't, don't let that worry enter the process too early, because a lot of times there is an artful and considerate way to, to even if something you find is, oh, we, we can be smarter about this or more conscientious about this topic. There's uh, a way to get there. And you know, I think a, a general rule of, of thumb, whether it's a joke or a subject matter, to ask yourself, is this you know, serving the community that I'm talking about? Is this a joke on somebody, or is it for somebody? And like, there's usually just a, a responsible way to do almost any joke. Um, and for drama, I don't, I don't know, but I would assume that it's similar with sensitive subject matter, that it's just about the path you take and what, what, the, what this, this thing that you're trying to say is. And if you uh, find your way through that and you're like, oh, okay, I'm actually, I, I may be using this character to, to point out a point of view that that this needs to be said, and even though it's inappropriate, the whole um, the message of this is is pure. Yeah, I would say those are my favorite kind of actually moments in writers' rooms where you get to that point of realizing that people you know have different feelings about something or sensitivities, and it's kind of there's a fear about how you're going to do it. I think that that's really important to lean into. I think it's. Um, that's what television is all about, especially right now, is sort of, and it, it, it's tricky to navigate, but I think what Zach said is important too, is just to not let that, those concerns um, create barriers in the beginning that um, would you know, keep you from exploring creative paths that people haven't seen on television, so yeah. Thanks. Nice, thank you. Next question. Yeah, you've talked about this a little bit, but I'm curious, um, brainstorming tools, like everybody gets stuck. You get stuck. How do I get from here to here? So either individually when you're thinking about your story or when you're in the writer's room, what are some like tips that you might use to kind of get the brainstorming going? Zach talked about playing games. So any, any ideas there, any suggestions? When you're writing in a, in a group or writing by yourself? I'm like saying, you know, as a group, let's okay. say. Okay. Um, well, I, I think that um, the mo it sounds sort of self helpy but being compassionate towards yourself rather than beating yourself up is important. Um, and then also stepping, like when you have a show, there are 20 things that you have to do at the, the same time and that there's deadlines. And, that sometimes it's worthwhile to take a step back and work on something else be because like just taking a step away from it may jog something. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, 
it's been the hardest thing for me to learn is to let go of things that aren't, when they're not working, I want everything to work right when it's happening, but in a writer's room, you get stuck and you have to just take a step back, move to you know a different uh, part of the story or a different episode or a completely different um, sort of wavelength. Uh, and then usually you'll find a different, a different way into that problem by you know trying a, a completely different uh, story. I would say in the writer's room, sometimes YouTube helps. Just, <laughs> oh, yeah, just definitely. going through and, and looking at other, um, whether it's if you're, if you're researching a topic, obviously it's a great um, resource, but sometimes just to kill time. Sometimes like you'll watch a video that'll make you cry in less than 20 seconds and you kind of, you're looking at it going, oh, I, now I know why this worked. Um, in the writing, you know, everyone's different when they get stuck, but for me, I, I like to think about um, uh, something Zach said. It's, it's thinking about the, the reasons why you started writing that story to begin with, and sometimes it's, it's about the money moments, you know, like the moments that you, it was like the scene or the moment or the decision that you thought of that was really interesting and that you know is gonna be on the trailer when the pilot premieres um, that the network is gonna plug, those are the moments that you, you, if you go back to them and think about them, sometimes it's, it's able, you're, you're able to kind of work through those and say, okay, this is why this is really important to me because I want to feature this moment, I want to feature this, this particular decision. So a lot of times for me that helps. Okay, nice. And unfortunately that's all the time we have today. Please Aww. thank all of our panelists. Thank you all for coming and enjoy the rest of your fest.